Greetings, nerdlings. We're going to be discussing cell transport in this video lecture. So, before we can discuss transport, we need to talk about what the membrane is composed of, or what it's made out of. So, the membrane has phospholipids, proteins, carbohydrates. So we have phospholipids here, and this is our phospholipid bilayer. And if you remember, that's one of our main biomolecules, lipids, which are fats. So the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane is made out of two layers of fats. We also have cholesterol. This helps to give the fluidity of the membrane. So it makes that membrane fluid. We also have proteins. We have some integral proteins which span the entire length of the plasma membrane and we have peripheral proteins which are just going across a portion. We have our carbohydrates right here which help in cell signaling. So the different components of the cell membrane. The proteins, they serve for transport, chemical receptors, cell recognition, attachment sites for cytoskeletal structures. We also have the phospholipids. This is that double layer that you see, and they move laterally within the membrane. Cholesterol, which helps keep the phospholipids spaced apart, thereby adding fluidity. And we also have surface carbohydrates. Those are used for cell recognition, meaning how one cell recognizes another. Cell signaling, this is very important in the immune system, as well as hormones. And cell adhesion, meaning how the cell sticks to other cells or other objects. The membrane is sometimes referred to as a fluid mosaic model. Fluid because the membrane moves like a fluid, and mosaic because it's like a work of art. If you look at the cell membrane from above, all of the different proteins and components make up this little mosaic art piece. So mosaic is kind of like an art piece made out of lots of different pieces of something else. You may have seen these in school or in museums where you have all kinds of itty bitty tiles everywhere and they make a big picture with all these little different colored tiles. That's a mosaic piece of art. So the cell membrane has polar heads, which are these guys right here. And those are hydrophilic, meaning they love water. Polar means they have a charge. Remember, water is a polar molecule, so the outside of the plasma membrane is probably going to love water. That's why we call it hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water, and philic or phyle means to love. And then we have our nonpolar tails. Those are where we're going to find the majority of our fats. So fats are nonpolar, so those are not going to love water. And in fact, we call those hydrophobic because they fear water. And this is what makes the membrane selectively permeable, meaning that it's going to let some things in but keep others out. So for example, if I poured a cup of water with rocks on top of my shirt, the water is going to permeate through my sleeve of the shirt, but the rocks are going to stay on top because my shirt is not permeable to the rocks. So there are different types of transport across a membrane. First, we have simple diffusion. This requires no energy, and it's just when molecules move from a very high concentration to a low concentration. They're going to diffuse out. So for example, if I sat in the front of my room and I sprayed this ax at the front of my room, that's gonna be a really high concentration. I'm gonna smell it first. Then it's going to start to diffuse out. My front row is going to smell it, then my second row, and my third row, in my fourth row, and eventually someone standing in the back of the classroom is going to be able to smell the ax that I sprayed in my class. And that's again simple diffusion, just moving from a high concentration to a low concentration and spreading out equally everywhere. So diffusion is a passive process. Passive means peaceful, so it does not require any energy. The molecules move with a natural kinetic energy, and again, it's not requiring energy, so they're just moving from high to a low concentration. So this is an example of diffusion of liquids. If I was to add food coloring to a beaker, at first it's going to be very, very concentrated. 
slowly it's going to bend, begin to diffuse out into the cup or the beaker. Eventually, it's going to form a homogeneous solution, meaning that all of those color particles are going to be evenly distributed in the water. So there's one very, very important type of transport, and that's called osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And water moves from a high water potential, meaning there's a lot of water in something, to a low water potential, meaning that it doesn't have a lot of water in it. So if I was going to say this has a high water potential and this cup here has a low water potential, water is going to flow from a high water potential to a low water potential. So it flows from high to low. So if you look right here, we have diffusion across a membrane and it's going to be flowing from high to a low concentration until everything is evenly distributed. So diffusion of water across a membrane. Again, we have a high water potential and a low solute concentration on this side. So here are all our water molecules. These little blue guys are our water molecules. We have a very high water potential over here and a lower water potential over here. We have a high solute concentration, and solute are things like salt and sugars or fats. So these little green guys are all solutes. So there's a high solute potential over here and a low water potential. On this side of the membrane, we have a high water potential but low solutes. So water is going to flow in this direction. We have three different types of solutions. We have isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. A cell that is in an isotonic solution has water flowing into and out of it at the exact same rate because the outside environment is exactly the same as the inside environment of the cell. So if you look here, the outside environment or the solution that that cell is inside of is composed of 10% sodium chloride, which is just table salt, and 90% water. The cell itself is composed of 10% sodium chloride and 90% water. So it has the same amount of solutes and the same amount of water, which means water is going to be flowing into the cell at the same rate that it's flowing out of the cell. It's still going to be going into and out of the cell, but it's going to be at the same rate. and we call this equilibrium. So when the cell is the same concentration of solutes in water as the outside solution, we say that that cell is at equilibrium with the solution that it's in. The next type of solution we're going to discuss is called hypotonic solution. A hypotonic solution is whenever there is more water outside of the cell in the solution than inside of the cell. So in this case, we have 10% sodium chloride outside of the cell, and inside of the cell, there is 20% sodium chloride. Because of this, water always wants to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. So water is going to move from outside the cell, as you can see there's more water, and less solutes, and it will move into the cell. So if something is in a hypotonic solution, remember this, Hypo is low and it blows like a puffer fish. So water is going to flow into that cell and the cell is going to blow up. So again, hypo is low and it blows. So this is a hypotonic solution the cell is in. So the cell is going to start receiving a lot of water because the cell wants to be at the same equilibrium or with the same amount of solutes in water as its external solution. So the direction of water is going to be flowing into the cell. Now, if the cell is placed into a hypertonic solution, that means that there is a higher concentration of solutes, in this case salt, and a lower concentration of water. 
than the cell. So the cell has a lower concentration of solutes and a higher concentration of water. So since there is a higher concentration of salt and only water can move and that cell wants to be at equilibrium with its external environment, it's going to lose water to the solution. So keep this in mind. Hyper is high and it sucks. We all have that friend who's like, oh my god, I broke up with my boyfriend today. And then I met a new guy named Edward, and Edward asked me out, so I decided to go out with Edward. But then this afternoon, my boyfriend gave me a flower, and I thought I would decide I would take him back, so I took my boyfriend back. But then he really, really made me angry because he was looking at Sally. So I broke up with him again, and you're like, oh my goodness, shush. So we all have one of those friends that's really, really hyper, and they just suck the energy out of you just like a hypertonic solution sucks the water out of the cell. So hyper is high and it sucks. So it sucks the water out of the cell. So when a cell is placed into a hypertonic solution, it's going to lose its water to the external environment and become really, really shriveled, like a raisin. So here we have examples of blood cells. So this first one right here is what a blood cell should look like, kind of like a little disc with an indent in the middle. And this cell is in an isotonic solution, meaning that there's the same amount of solutes inside as there are outside of the cell. So water is flowing into and out of the cell at the same rate. The second right here, this cell was placed in a hypotonic solution. So as you can see, the cell itself is hypertonic concerning to the outside environment. I mean compared to the outside environment. So the outside environment has more water and less solutes, whereas the cell has more solutes and less water. So outside is hypotonic, hypo is low, and it blows. So the water is getting blown into the cell as you can see right here, and eventually that cell is going to burst open. And we call that cytolysis. Cyto meaning cell, and lysis meaning to split. The last type of environment is called hypertonic. So as you can see, the cell is in a solution that has a lot more solutes than the cell does. So all these little guys right here would be solutes. In this instance, we would say that they're salt. So there's a lot of salt outside the cell, but not much into the cell. But the salt can't move into the cell or out of the cell, so water has to flow in or out. So because the cell wants to be at equilibrium with its environment, water is going to move out of the cell, and it's going to lose all of its water and shrivel up into a little raisin. So remember, hyper is high, and it sucks. It sucks the water out. And we call this plasmolysis. So here's another diagram. We have our regular red blood cells, and these are in an isotonic solution. If we place these regular blood cells in a hypotonic solution, remember, hypo is low and it blows. So the cells themselves here had more solutes inside of them and the outside had less solutes and more water, so the water got blown into the cell. Over here, the cells were placed in a hypertonic solution, meaning a lot of salt, so it sucked the water out. The hypertonic solution of salt sucked the water out of the cell, and the cell shrivels up, and we call that plasmolysis. So here's another example of red blood cells under a microscope. This one, is in an isotonic solution, meaning there are the same amount of solutes inside the cell as there are outside of the cell. Hypotonic, so this cell had more solutes inside of it than it did outside. The outside environment had a very low amount of solutes. So since it had a low amount of solutes, hypo is low and it blows. So it blew all of that water into the red blood cell, and now the red blood cell is swelling up, and eventually it's going to burst. And then the last type of solution is called hypertonic, 
Remember, hyper is high and it sucks. So this red blood cell got placed into a salt water solution. And as you can see, it's starting to shrivel up. So hyper is high and it sucks. Well, that concludes part one of our cell transport. Next time, we're going to be talking about the different types of transport, active versus passive. I'll see you guys soon.